Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable President of Federation of Asian Nutrition Societies, Professor Hardin Shah MS. Distinguished speakers, Region, Regional Marketing Leader of DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences of Asia Pacific, Michelle Lee, MBA. Regional Products Manager, Probiotics of DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences of ASEAN, Linda Chen, MSc. Vice Head of, Mic of Micronutrient Department, National Institute of Nutrition Vietnam, Dr. Tran Can Van. Applied Nutrition Manager of DuPont Nutrition and Bioscience of China, Hong Wei Wang, MD, PhD, RD. Professor of Agricultural Technology, Mulawarman University and Food and Nutrition Society of East Kalimantan, Indonesia, Professor Dr. Bernatal Saragi, MSI. And last but not least, all participants of today's webinar series of the second ISFAN. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the second International Symposium on Food and Nutrition. My name is Nawaf Tresnanda as the fourth year nutrition student of IPB University, Indonesia. I am honored to accompany you as the master of ceremony of today's webinar series. The second International Symposium on Food and Nutrition, or ISFAN, is being organized by the Food and Nutrition Society of Indonesia as an adhering body of Federation of Asian Nutrition Societies and International Union of Nutritional Sciences with the theme, Asian Consumers' Insights, Trends in Consumers' Behavior on Nutrition, Probiotics, and Wellness. This symposium is organized by the Food and Nutrition, and Nutrition Society of Indonesia under the auspices of Southeast Asia Probiotic Scientific and Regulatory Network, Southeast Asia, Public Health Nutrition Network, Federation of Asian Nutrition Societies, and International Union of Nutritional Sciences. This webinar series is organized every Friday at 2 till 4 p.m. of Jakarta time from 7th of August to 4th of December of 2020. It is expected to broaden our knowledge and deepen our understanding of nutrition problems and solutions, especially in Asia. Before we start the program, let us hear the opening remarks from the President of Federation of Asian Nutrition Societies, Professor Hardin Shah MS. The time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, now after Snanda is our master of ceremony today. My respected guests, speakers, and all representative of the Nutrition Society of Asian countries, and all participants from several countries would like to mention in this uh, opening remark that there are nine countries uh, attended this, uh, nine countries participants attended this uh, symposia today from Australia, China, India, Japan, Pakistan, Malaysia, Singapore, UK, and Vietnam. So thank you for all that uh, even most of the participants from Indonesia, but we are happy that as an international symposium, at least should be attended by four countries. Now we are here, nine countries uh, participant. And I would like also to thanks to uh, DuPont Nutrition Bioscience, especially Cindy Ao, that also here. And also thanks to Dermanto from Pete Greenfield, Indonesia, and also to uh, ACC of Vietnam, especially uh, Dr. Dubon, that already uh, support especially for today uh, session. And uh, today session, especially would like to uh, discuss about the future and the current, the current and the future uh, market, especially on the functional food and probiotics in Asia, and also on the soy uh, protein or soy ingredient in, in Asia. Would like also to thanks to Michelle Lee, MBA from uh, Nutri uh, DuPont Nutrition Bioscience Asia Pacific, to Linda Chen, MSc from DuPont Nutrition Bioscience Asia, and Dr. Tran Kan Fan, 
as a vice chair of uh, micronutrient department at Nut uh, National Nutrition uh, Institute of Vietnam, and also to Dr. Hong Wei Wang, MD, from DuPont Nutrition Bioscience uh, China. And from Indonesia, Prof. Bernatal, especially from a little bit far away from Indonesia, it is in the eastern of Kalimantan. He works on a functional food component that we would like as a representative for the Food and Nutrition Society of Indonesia to present about uh, uh, his uh, studies. And I would like also to inform you based on our uh, data from the host from the registration information that the participant that registered today, some they are outside uh, watching through the live streaming uh, in the YouTube. Uh, about 25% is less than 20 years old. Yeah, this is Z generation, yeah, from 16 to 20 years old. And about 40% from 20 to uh, 40 years old and over uh, 40 years, as uh, we call that the Y and uh, X generation, uh, the, the rest. And when we ask the question about the definition of probiotic, exactly about 98%, they say yes about the definition according to the, we quote the definition from the WHO. And when we ask about, do you think the, yogurt product contain probiotic and about 70% say yes. Actually, it depends on, yeah, not always uh, yogurt product uh, contain probiotic. It depends on the number of the uh, good bacteria inside and the uh, benefit of that uh, micro, good microbiota, but at least we understand that the perception of the, 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 the participant that they think that is already beyond the, our expectation. And when we ask about the, do you believe that ginger is one of the, one of traditional Asian ingredients that could uh, better for inflammatory uh, immune effect? And 96% say yes. So it seems that more young generation, especially uh, registered to this uh, symposium, have a good knowledge on good bacteria, good knowledge on probiotics, and also good knowledge on uh, traditional ingredients. Without further ado, I would like to finish my welcoming remark. And again, to thanks to you all and enjoy the today's symposium. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Hardin Shah MS, for the wonderful remarks. It is time from, for the presentation from today's well-known speakers that will be led by the moderator. Uh, thank you very much. So, Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So first of all, I would like to, it is an honor today that I was uh, given this important task to moderate the today's session. So thank you, Prof. Hardin Sa, as the president of the Federation of Asian Nutrition Societies to give me this opportunity. Uh, as we know, today we will discuss about the importance of uh, nutrition, probiotics, and wellness in Asia today for today's consumers. So we will learn about nutrition, probiotics, and wellness in Asia from the perspective of, uh, from the consumer side, and then from the research done in the Vietnam, as well as in sport, yeah, with regard to the uh, wellness, uh, Dr. Hong Wei Wang will later explain about the role of nutrition in sport what are the current trend and then uh, professor dr bernatal saragi later on will highlight what are the local ingredients uh, give uh, function on nutrition uh, 
Uh, we will invite the first speaker for today, which is uh, Miss Michelle Lee. She is the uh, Asia Pacific uh, Marketing Leader of DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences based in Singapore. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Hadin Shah for the opportunity to speak in this webinar series. And thanks to all of you for taking the time out to be with us today. In this session, I would like to share with you the market and consumer insights that we have gathered in DuPont so that we could understand our consumers better, especially during the pandemic situation. And we hoped to partner with you in your product innovation journey. I will first cover how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted on consumers from health and consumption behavior perspective. Then I'll go deeper into the emerging trends and also covering senior health needs. We all may have already observed from our friends and family members, the lifestyle changes that has happened because of COVID-19. And we cannot deny that COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant emotional impact and has resulted many changes in consumers' behavior and even their value perception in life. This can be supported by the consumer survey result we have gathered here, where we see close to 50% of the consumers, they're worried or concerned over their physical health and fitness in Asia Pacific. This survey was done in the month of August, when most of the countries already in the recovery period. The statistic here showed that consumers in the Philippines, South Korea, India, China, and Singapore are the top five countries expressed their concern. Similar results are observed when we ask them about their health concerns, especially on mental well-being. Restricted movement, moving from working in office to working from home has resulted in a different behaviors and life activities. For example, when we stay at home more often or longer period of time, we tend to snack more. And some of the consumers say that they have actually developed new hobbies like baking or even they cook more at home. Or some of the younger consumers, they also told us that they play on video online, um, or video game online more often. Or they started to chat with some strangers online just to spend some of their spare time. With the restrictive movement, lack of physical activities, snack more at home, we have seen that the new phenomenal has happened, which is weight gain among consumers in this period of time. Quarantine 15 is now the new term, whereby consumers gain about 15 pounds during this period. And as a result, they are now looking for tips to eat healthier, tips to um, eat healthily in their daily uh, meals. And at the same time, they also look for weight management solutions. Therefore, interruptions in daily activities and lifestyle changes has become a major issue. There are more than 60% of Southeast Asian consumers expressed concern on lifestyle changes and they approximately 50% of them say that social restriction has affected them emotionally. And this is not any different from what has happened in China, where we see pandemic has heightened the health needs, where more than 70% of the surveyed consumers say that they will continue to increase physical activity and eat healthily just to improve their immune health. And there were more than 50% of them told us that they have actually increased expenses on sports 
and health-related uh, food supplements as early as March, where pandemic was at the peak period. Generally, we observe that pandemic has also changed the value in life among Chinese consumers, where they now have reprioritized the life quality over material, and they treasure and value time spent with their families and at the same time, they have also become more aware of the need to protect environment and animal welfare. Lastly, we also see the economical impact on consumer spending, where there were more than 65% of the Chinese consumers said that they have a budget and they try to stick to it as much as possible. What I can conclude here is, there is an obvious trend observed as an impact of the pandemic. That consumers are initially paying a lot of attention on protecting themselves and their families from infection. Hence, they focus more on strengthening immunity, nutrition enhancement, personal and household hygiene. And as the situation develops, consumers are now switching to a healthier lifestyle where preventive mindset start to kick in. They want to be ready and they want to avoid any future health-related crisis or any infections that they have, may have faced again. With that, we see a paradigm shift in consumer mindset, mindset and behaviors. Where we could see the trends of consumers looking for more convenient and value-for-money products while they start to assess and moving into more sustainable lifestyle and they want to start to stay healthier. And at the same time, they are also start to look for more enjoyment in life and they look to brand for reassurance. They look to brand to build the trust that they have between the brands and themselves and their value and therefore to ensure brands deliver their promise is very important in this time. Brands could now take this as a starting point to evaluate the innovation platform, to align their product value, to offer convenient value for money product, those that can improve consumers' health, at the same time also offer satisfaction and indulgent experiences for the consumer. Are we all now ready for the new normal? How do we identify the new opportunities with these emerging trends that drive new behaviors? Below are some of the emerging consumer trends that I would like to highlight with you today, which really I see this as a true innovation opportunities for us to meet these new consumption needs. First, we talk about preparedness mindset. Consumers are now investing more and more on their own and their family's health. They start to go for healthier choices. They read more on nutrition. They read more on how to live healthier. And all these lifestyle changes has actually created new daily activities such as working from home, studying at home, fitness at home, or even socializing at home. More time at home has created new needs. For example, in Japan, we see some new product launches that, that are targeting digital detox. They are positioned to improve eye health, mainly because there is a prolonged uh, screen hours or screen time because of the digital devices usage. And at the same time, there are also some products communicate to help promoting good seating posture while consumers work or studying at home. On another hand, we also see the changes in the dining patterns and choices with more in-home consumptions means that out-of-home consumptions habit has evolved. This would be really a good opportunity to help consumers to improve convenience of home eating 
or even provide more recipe ideas to make home eating exciting. We also see consumers shop online more often than before. As high as 30% of Indonesian consumers actually shop for the first time online on grocery items during this pandemic. Now, making inroad into a digital space and increased brand digital communication is another important aspect. We also talk about life priority changes, where family bonding time are being seen as precious and is very important for their life today. Would product that helps foster this bonding moment something that worth considering? Increased awareness of environment protection is another important emerging trend that I would like to emphasize here as there are 48% of Indonesian consumer find plant-based diet is somewhat appealing and there were 23% of them say it is very appealing. They are seeing plant-based diet as healthier choices and at the same time, it is also friendly to our environment. Lastly, we must not forget the impact of the pandemic on our senior citizens. According to WHO, older adults are those who have underlying health conditions. They are actually at higher risk of developing severe forms of COVID-19. Hence, it is very important for us to protect our seniors and help them to stay healthy. Elderly are the more vulnerable group as they are at a higher prevalence of hypertension, diabetes that may lead to more complications from infections. On another hand, social distancing may impact their mental well-being. Prolonged loneliness, reduced interactions with family may negatively impact their health too. Therefore, it is important to help this group of seniors by providing them delicious nutrition and at the same time also create activities that could encourage them to interact digitally with friends and family. This is especially true when we look at top health concern among Indonesian consumers, where 40% of surveyed consumers, they are currently saying that they face joint and bone health issues, that this may have resulted in reduced mobility. At the same time, they also say that they have weak vision, they are facing high cholesterol problem, digestive, fatigue, high blood pressure. All these are the health issues that are being faced by our consumers aged 55 and above in Indonesia today. Corresponding to the health issues that they are facing, on the left chart, we also see that bone health, heart health, improved memory and fatigue are the top aspects of health that the consumers would like to improve upon. And the good news here is, more than 90% of the consumers in Indonesia believe that improved nutrition can help address health challenges due to aging. And there are as high as 70% of them perceive nutritional beverages with a mixture of soy and dairy are of high nutritional value and are able to help them improve their overall health status. With all these changes, consumers are now looking for products with health claims and positive nutrition in food and drinks more than ever before. In terms of products positioned for immune boosting, gut health and digestion, improved sleep quality, there are more than half of cervix consumers in Asia Pacific find it appealing. This is especially true among Indonesian Thais and Chinese consumers. For products with positive nutrition claims such as high protein, high in fiber and contain probiotics, 
consumers in Southeast Asia said that they are very appealing. And what I would like to highlight here is there are more than a third of Indonesian consumers find high in fiber protein are very appealing for them. When we switch over to insights on home cooking, the key reasons why Indonesian consumers find home cooking appealing is because they are able to cater for their family members' needs and preferences when they cook and eat at home. And the fact that they are able to control over the type of ingredients they put into the meal during meal preparation is something they find it very enjoyable and they feel safe, they feel secured because they know the origins and what is being put inside their meal. However, there's still the gap here because they are 52% of consumer, they still want home cooking to be more convenient and there are 35% of them want it to be more affordable and value for money. This brings me to my next discussion point on how brands could take the opportunities to create value differentiation by offering real value to consumers. As value for money doesn't have to come from discounted price or low price, but from creating real value with additional features additional health benefits, such as other benefits like convenience or enhanced eating experience by dialing up taste and texture, either for health benefits or indulgent purposes. In conclusion, understand the changes in consumers' needs due to the lifestyle changes is truly important for us to stay ahead of the curve in providing products that continue to delight our consumers. With that, I would like to bring to you some ideas how you could power through with the pond to provide both positive and immune nutrition with a balance of taste and texture to satisfy consumers of different age group. For example, functional energy drinking milk for kids, spoonable yogurt enriched with protein and probiotics for all family, high calcium milk for seniors, and complete nutrition with unique golden protein blends to improve muscle health. There's also a wide range of food solutions to meet aging nutrition needs that we could partner with you to address this underserved group. And lastly, our Dennis Go Planet will be with you in every step from concept to commercialization in providing delicious plant-based food and beverages to meet increased consumer demand. With that, I leave these thoughts with you and thank you very much for your time. So, Miss Michelle Lee for the it's a very insightful presentation yeah so I'm thinking while listening that presentation how close those data presented to myself and maybe all of you also thinking whether this kind of observation also happened to to you okay and then the next uh, presenter the, the next presentation it will be done in tandem by Ms. Linda Chen, who will talk about trends in science and consumer in probiotics in Asia. Uh, Ms. Linda Chen is the regional product manager of probiotics from DuPont Nutrition and Bioscience in Asia. And then her presentation will be followed by Dr. Tran Khan Fan. Hello, Dr. Fan. It's nice to meet you again here. Uh, May, uh, Dr. Fan is the vice head of the micronutrient department from the National Institute of Nutrition, Vietnam, uh, based in Hanoi. She will talk about the effectiveness of probiotics on immune boost against uh, upper re re respiratory tract infection. So, uh, Ms. Linda Chen and Dr. Fan, you have 18 minutes to present uh, your, present your talk. Please. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for giving me this opportunity um, 
for the speak today. I will just utilize a couple minutes to quickly touch base on the key trends of probiotics, new development in science and application. The majority time of this session will be allocated to our dear guest speaker, Dr. Van, on the probiotics on immune booster study sharing. In terms of the application development, the traditional probiotics application is mainly at yogurt and the baby food. Uh, while in recent years, um, sorry, let me minimize it. While in recent years, that supplement uh, is also growing very fast. With the new application and the manufacturing process development, nowadays the probiotics concepts are also penetrating into other food segments, such as um, juice and especially in snack industry. We see big players are launching probiotics containing snacks, such as Lotte uh, launched the probiotics chocolate and a biscuit, and the Kellogg launched the cereal snack containing symbiotics, and the Unilever also launched the probiotics ice cream. In terms of science development, we all know that the traditional most popular benefit of probiotics is digestive health. But in recent years, more and more new studies is focusing on the extension of health benefits that is beyond digestive health and trying to further understand the probiotics mechanism and impact on the overall health and the wellness and how it may influence on the chronic health condition. More study has been shown the probiotics benefits for immune health, um, mental health, um, metabolism health, and oral health. Well, in 2020, it has no doubt that the focus for the consumer has come back to immunity um, due for the pandemic. For us here, you can see from the Google trend, uh, the, the interest of immunity has really surged in the past few months. Well, the good news is that probiotics as one of the most studied uh, immune ingredients um, based on a simple um, a PubMed search. And uh, for example, um, there's more clinical studies for upper respiratory tract illness uh, has been conducted on probiotics compared with vitamin C and D, zinc, elderberry, yeah. And another very interesting point is to really um, to note that a clinically documented probiotics benefit for immune function are strain specific. So it means if it is, even if it is the same genus species, but if it's the strain is different, then um, the, the clinical study implication of the health benefit will be different. Last, let's have a quick look on how the successful brand communicate with their consumers on the immune health benefit. Famous brands like Anway or Yako, uh, they try to educate the consumer with simple words, some, such as 70% of your immune system is actually located at your gut. And some of the um, very successful brands, they are highlighting the strain name and they are literally quote the clinical study result to attract the consumers. Yeah, that's all for today's quick sharing. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, um, so the result in the, in the picture A uh, here show that um, the BL04 uh, the, the, the BL uh, the group, uh, there was a 27% risk reduction for any upper respiratory choice infection episode in, compared to the placebo group. And the second uh, picture here, uh, uh, the picture B, so that um, uh, the, so the interesting outcome was mean time between episode. The time between onset of upper respiratory tract inflammatory in the uh, group using BL04 was 3.2 months compared to the base, uh, small group in the time is 2.5 months. Uh, so we look at the second uh, evidence is a study of uh, effective, uh, effective effect of probiotic on innate inflammatory response and viral shedding in the experimental rhinovirus infection. The objective of this study is to assess the effect of ingestion of BL04 on the host response to rhinovirus infection in upper respiratory tract of human volunteer using the experimental rhinovirus challenge model. 
about the methods, the study material, uh, we, uh, the research used probiotic BL04 uh, mixed with, with one gram of sucrose and the principal uh, sachet containing just one gram of sucrose. And this also randomized double blind principal uh, control trial with two parallel arms. The challenge, the viral challenge is uh, the rhinovirus A39 and about the virus isolation and ser serology, the nasal larvae uh, specimen, uh, specimens collected on day two, uh, day zero, and uh, the, the, on the subject was tested by PCR for detection of unsuspected viral respiratory infections. And then the nasal larvae collected on study on day one to five and was cultured for rhinovirus by standard methods. And also study on the measure the neutralizing antibody of rhinovirus A39. Here we look at the process of experimental rhinovirus as a challenge study in healthy adults. The subject uh, in the uh, BL04 uh, was uh, supplemented by, uh, by a probiotic for 28 days before the virus challenge uh, on day zero, we call it day zero. And the interleukin eight and virus level from natural wash uh, and symptoms of common cold was measured from day one to day five. Uh, now we look at the result uh, in the picture A. We see here the concentration of uh, interleukin H was higher at day zero after four weeks of BL04 supplementation. Um, and the relative interleukin H response during infection was lower in BL04 groups over the infection time compared to the placebo groups. Now we see the, the effect of probiotic or nation inflammatory response to rhinovirus. Uh, we see that um, the, um, the, uh, the chemokin uh, and the ligand H in the nation lavish uh, wash on the experimental days was higher in probiotic groups compared to the placebo groups. And these pictures show the effect of probiotics on the biotics on the rhinovirus inflammatory response, in, including chemokin, ligand 10, uh, interleukin 6 uh, concentration, and the granulocyte stimulating factor in the nation wash of the volunteers. About the efficacy of probiotic on the rhinovirus and antibody response, this is a very interesting findings. The vital type of the viral titers of the 28-day probiotic groups was significantly lower than the principal groups, and, and at the same time, the um, the shedding uh, the viral shedding via nasal washes in the probiotic group was also significantly lower in in that of the control group. This means um, that people who take the probiotic over time, if they have an upper respiratory tract infection caused by rhinovirus, their chances of transmitting virus to others are also lower than those who do not use probiotics. About the effect of probiotics on lower respiratory uh, uh, inflammation, the study measuring the XL nitric oxide to determine, determine lower respiratory tract inflammatory. Uh, this show uh, significantly lower in the probiotic groups compared to that of placebo control group. And this is uh, and this effect of probiotic treatment on symptom score, and this is better in the probiotic groups uh, compared to placebo group. Uh, regarding the, the gastro, gastrointestinal adverse events, the results show the 13 occurrences uh, in the nine subjects, and it's only reported in the probiotic groups. Uh, so, depend on the summaries of uh, two uh, resource evidences, we can have a summaries of BL04 community and rhinovirus challenge study. The BL04 supplementation at, uh, at research dose uh, daily may have to improve res respiratory health in healthy adults. And the second 
Uh, the BLO4 might enhance resistance to upper respiratory viral infections and the common cold, cold by important function of mucosal innate immunity that, in, that inhibits the life cycle of rhinovirus in the nasal epithelium. And thus, about summarizing, uh, summarizing the benefits of probiotic solution to maintain healthy respiratory function is that the BL04 helps to maintain the body's natural immune defenses and healthy respiratory function, particularly reducing the risk of upper respiratory tract in this episode in healthy, physically active adults. Um, thank you for your attention. And luckily, I just have to present half of the uh, the the present of my presentation, and uh, and I hope that you enjoy my Vietnamese as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fan. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, today we learn about Vietnam. We hear uh, Dr. Fan. Uh, Vietnamese, so it's uh, I always like to listen to that, and then we also learn about uh, immune function. So we have a short lecture about immune function, and then uh, Dr. Van also highlight uh, that actually even among actively healthy individuals, uh, adults, uh, supplementation of probiotics can reduce risk of upper risk respiratory tract infections. And Ms. Linda Chen showed that actually a lot of products, uh, food products and supplements uh, are enriched with probiotics. Continue with the fourth presentation, which will be given by Dr. Dr. Hong Wei Wang. Uh, he is the Applied Nutrition Manager of Dupont Nutrition and Biosciences. And I have seen Dr. Hongwei is there ready. Uh, please, Dr. Hongwei, you have 18 minutes to present. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizer, the coordinator, and also my colleague uh, in Singapore to invite me here to uh, give this presentation. Uh, today my topic is about current and the future direction of sports nutrition science and wellness. And I will focus on the role of uh, protein. So to address this topic, I will start with the latest trend in sports nutrition, then followed by uh, introduction of the role of soil protein in sports nutrition, then summarize uh, the presentation. So let's see what's the latest trend in sports nutrition. When we are talking about sports, actually what's coming in mind is strength, speed, force, this kind of uh, things, and all these things are about sports performance. You know, for performance, muscle is very important. So that's a reason actually nowadays many uh, research and also many uh, studies are about the how to increase muscle mass or the muscle function for sports people. So here you can see actually for uh, uh, different scientific body, for example, the one from International Society of Sports Nutrition, they recommend for building muscle mass and for maintaining muscle mass through a positive muscle protein balance, the daily protein intake should be 1.4 to 2.0 gram per kilogram body weight. And they also recommend for this protein, it should contain 700 to 3000 milligram of uh, brain chain amino acid leucine. And also you can see this similar recommendation from, uh, for example, from this uh, article by uh, Phillips and uh, colleagues. It's that the uh, daily protein intake should be uh, 
1.6 gram per kilogram body weight up to 2.2 gram per kilogram body weight. Actually, for sports nutrition, it's not only about athletes because nowadays many people start to do sports because we know for muscle, it's very important for postprandial glucose disposal. And it's also very important for maintaining insulin sensitivity. It's also important for the resting energy expenditure. So all these things made muscle, make muscle very important in metabolic health, also important for body weight control and also for uh, prevention of some chronic disease like uh, uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. And we know nowadays in a developed country, also many developing country, actually more and more people have a metabolic uh, uh, syndrome and also have a, a type 2 diabetes and obesity, this kind of uh, so-called non-communicable chronic disease. For example, in China, every 10 adults, there are two with hypertension and there are four with uh, uh, lipidemia and also one for type 2 diabetes. So nowadays, this already becomes some kind of epidemic and people want to improve health, want to prevent uh, chronic disease. So they realize sports is a very important lifestyle factor to, to, to help to achieve this goal. That's the reason nowadays actually many people focus on uh, uh, sports exercise and they also want to use sports nutrition to improve the uh, effect. That's the reason nowadays when we are talking about sports nutrition, it's not only about a, a professional athletes, it's also about the expanding population of so-called creational sports people or lifestyle user. So we know muscle health is very uh, important, but muscle is not but but muscle is uh, not only about the protein and on, uh, on the other way it's also right. For protein it's not also for muscle. We know for muscle uh, protein, especially the branch chain amino acid in uh, the protein is a building block of a muscle mass. And uh, also protein as one of the three macronutrients, it has been playing a very important role in our uh, nutrition and uh, health. That's that, that's the reason when we are talking about protein and muscle, yes, protein and amino acid can be our focus. But when we are talking about this in a broader context, for example, when we are looking into also the effect on non-communicable -communic disease, also looking about, for example, the parameter like uh, mortality, then we have to lo also look into the protein uh, source, also the uh, prof uh, amino acid profile in the protein, especially the branch chain amino acid on top of the amount of protein. That's why actually nowadays there are some uh, controversy, for example, from this uh, study I show you here, you can see uh, it's being indicated the intake of a brain chain amino acid, especially leucine, actually is also related to higher risk for type 2 diabetes. And uh, you can find out many this kind of uh, uh, literature. And here I collect some uh, uh, recent publication about uh, the discussion of the association among uh, protein intake and uh, mortality and other health uh, outcomes. For example, this one is uh, 
about uh, a Japanese uh, cohort and the meta-analysis, uh, the author look into the association, so association of animal and plant protein intake with all cause and also cause specific mortality. And this one, it's uh, also meta-analysis and uh, uh, more or less actually they are uh, uh, endpoints the same. They uh, are focusing on uh, mortality. And this one is uh, based on the based on uh, the two US cohort study, also a meta analysis. And this one is uh, also meta analysis, but focus on population from uh, the Netherlands. So it's uh, a study called the Rotterdam study. And uh, this one also looking into the association of uh, protein intake with uh, mortality and some other factors. But this one also uh, try to differentiate the effect on uh, old population and uh, younger population. Here, it's uh, another latest uh, uh, publication. Actually, for all these uh, studies, which I didn't go to details, for the uh, total protein intake, in some study, maybe it's uh, uh, associated with a higher mortality, and uh, in some other study, maybe in a lower mortality, or in some study, no association. And for animal protein, it's associated with increased uh, mortality. But with all this uh, conflicting results existed in the study, one thing is for sure, that is plant protein intake is consistently associated with low mortality and other health benefits. We already know actually uh, plant protein, the, uh, there are many health benefits and the mechanism can be complicate, complicated. Here yeah. I uh, use this slide to show you actually one of the mechanism may be because of the uh, beneficial interaction with gut microbiota. Gut microbiota is already a topic for, uh, for today. So I will not go to detail briefly. Nowadays, we realize in our human gut, there are about 100 trillion microorganisms with uh, a gene pool of uh, about 3 million. So it, it's, uh, it's uh, from the number, also from the number of genes already uh, higher than what we human beings have. So, uh, there are already many studies uh, linked gut microbiota to health and disease. And uh, this is uh, understandable because, you know, actually uh, for our diet, diet is an important factor related to our health and uh, disease. So in our diet, there is always some uh, so-called non-digestible uh, components which go to colon and get fermented there. And uh, for the fermentation, actually, uh, it's a process uh, describing uh, how the uh, gut microbiota using the substrate. So for different uh, bacteria, for different uh, substrate, the fermentation products can be different. So the uh, effect on our uh, human health is also different. Here you can see for, in general, for plant protein, uh, it help increase the uh, good bacteria in our gut and uh, consequently increase the uh, uh, fermentation product like the short-chain fatty acid, which has been linked to improved uh, uh, gut barrier and uh, have a good uh, modulation effect on our immune system. And all, and then for animal protein in general, uh, the colon fermentation of animal protein uh, will increase uh, the bad bacteria and uh, 
also increase the uh, uh, metabolite like the TMAO, which has been uh, linked to increased risk of cardiovascular disease and also other uh, disease like IBD. So for gut microbiota, I will come back uh, to this point later. Next, I will show you. So we know muscle is important and protein and amino acid are playing a role in muscle health. Then I also tell you, okay, so for protein, it's not only about the, pro the amount, it's also about the quality, about the amino acid profile, and also about the sources, where it's from, it's plant or it's animal protein. Next, I will tell you, why soil protein can play a special role in sports nutrition. So when we are talking about a protein, yes, uh, one of the important things is about the quality. So for quality, nowadays, the globally recognized uh, uh, method for determining uh, protein quality is the PD cas So according to this method, the isolated soil protein and milk protein and egg white protein, they are all high quality complete protein. And isolated soil protein is the only plant protein which uh, has a PD cast of one. In addition, there is also other advantage. For example, low in fat, especially saturated fat and cholesterol free and lactose free. So all these things tell us, yes, uh, soil protein can be as good as animal protein regarding uh, the uh, cars. And for the effects of soil protein on uh, muscle health, here I uh, uh, collected some study and a summaries here. Uh, in short, whether it's in acute study or in long-term study, we find out that actually uh, soil protein help to increase uh, muscle mass. And if you look into the study, then it, uh, maybe the study period is uh, short, is long. And if you uh, also look into the, uh, the, uh, dosage, the dosage of the protein, it can be high or low. But all this study told us soil protein can be as good as whey protein regarding the effect on muscle health. So there are also study comparing the effect of, of uh, soil protein and whey protein uh, on uh, body weight uh, management and body composition. For all this study, I will not go to detail. One thing I want to uh, remind you is all these study tell us, yes, uh, they both are good at uh, uh, body weight control and improve uh, lean body mass. But in, in addition to this, soil protein can also help to Im improve metabolic health. For example, uh, reduce plasma glucose, plasma cholesterol, uh, inhibit the uh, inflammatory cytokine like uh, the interleukin-6 and also help to improve insulin sensitivity. And here is also uh, a summary about the health effect of soil protein on heart health. Due to its uh, beneficial effect on uh, blood lipids, blood pressure, and uh, the effect on blood vessel function, also the atherosclerosis progression, all these things uh, together make soil protein a, a unique protein source for heart health. So the US FDA already approved a health claim for soil protein. It said 25 gram of soil protein per day help to increase, uh, help to uh, reduce the risk of heart disease. Actually, uh, totally nowadays, 13 uh, countries already uh, authorized a health claim, uh, either for reduction of cholesterol or, impro or improvement of uh, heart health. 
And you have I two just minutes. Uh, told... Two minutes. Okay. More. Okay. Okay. And also for uh, soil protein, it's also possible for you to use uh, together with other uh, protein because we know for people, we have different preference for, for protein, some like uh, animal protein, some like plant, but it doesn't matter. When we put them together, it's also help to uh, build up muscle mass. So there are serious study from animal study to clinical trial and in different population. I will not go to details. So uh, come back to gut microbiota again. There is also study to show actually soil protein help to increase uh, uh, the uh, diversity of gut microbiota. And we know diversity is a, a parameter for a better, uh, for a beneficial effect. And I will not go to detail, just to show you the result here. So we know soil protein, yes, is as good as whey protein regarding the effect on uh, muscle health. And uh, in addition to that, there is also uh, other health benefits like the benefits for uh, heart health, for metabolic health. And also I just show you, there is also study to show uh, soil protein is doing a beneficial role on gut microbiota. And we know gut microbiota has been linked to uh, health and disease, and of course also for muscle health. That's uh, the reason nowadays there is also a hypothesis about this gut muscle axis. We know gut brain axis, it's a, it's a, it's a, a popular, but now there may be also gut muscle axis. And in my opinion, now more and more studies uh, indicate yes, uh, gut microbiota also may be playing an important role in uh, sports nutrition. So maybe in the future, if we do more study to find out how gut microbiota is playing a role in uh, uh, sports nutrition, especially, especially related to muscle health and uh, Relate to uh, soil protein, then I'm sure more information will help to uh, 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 develop a so called uh, personalized uh, uh, nutrition strategy for sports people and also for uh, common people who are conducting uh, uh, sports for a specific goal. Uh, that's all for me this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hong Wei Wang. So Thank you. we learned about uh, protein intake. So for protein in sport, the requirements is a little bit higher than normal requirement. Uh, with regard to protein, not only the amount, but also the type, and you highlight the importance of brand chains, uh, amino acids, leucine, and the good thing of soy protein, yeah? in sport nutrition and actually as the same as with regard to probiotics and upper respiratory tract infections there are many more things need to study with regard to protein and sport nutrition okay uh, the last is the presentation from professor dr bernatar saragi um, the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture of uh, University of Mulawarman and also the member of the Food and Nutrition Society of Indonesia. So actually, Prof. Bernatal is the chairman of the East Kalimantan um, branch, let's say, not branch, uh, office. So Prof. Bernatal Saragi will share about the health benefits of ASEAN traditional ingredients, ginger, curcumin, turmeric, lemongrass, garlic, and onions. So, Prof. Saragi, time is yours, please. Okay, thanks to moderators, Ms. Siti, and all of speakers and participants. And we realize that in current condition, I think so, we have something a problem about the health during the COVID pandemic. And I think so we have 
attention to health increasing rapidly at things including the use of spice i think you know that what is the spice and heart is the different things and then the all of people said there's the little games uh, spice at the flavor to you they are also good for your heart i think so in the use of this spice has been carried out for a long time by our Asentors, especially in Asia and the tropics area. Uh, people often wonder what the difference between uh, herb and spice. What is the spice? Spice refer to seasoning made from dried seed or water things. The spice generally originates in the far east and tropical countries. And what is the herbs? Herbs refer to any plant with plastic part. They are used in the green tea and uh, seasoning food or as the medicines. I think you know what the different uh, towards spice and herbs. And then why spice added to food? Uh, some people uh, use the spice to food to make uh, a different flavorings also and has the flavor of food and passes and tips and properties and also preservatives and pungent spice to make a sweet. Uh, even we eat the spice to make our bodies sweet and hot, I think so. Then also the pass strong antimicrobial properties and the colorant. How about the a benefit of spice? And also in the other research, we can find the many function about the uh, spice. The first one is the act as antioxidant, also a boosting immunity system. I think to make increase our system body and also anti-inflammatory properties, and then. As you know, antimicrobial, some component of bioactive from the plant and also the spice to make uh, our foods uh, preserved, I think. And then we improve memory and brain function. And after that, five nasal cognition and also improve digestion and regulation. Now, we have done uh, one research uh, after the pandemic COVID. Yeah, condition. The best question is, are you increasingly making drink from spice? And just 24% to say no and 76% yes. And then after that, we try to ask, did you do the spice to diet during the COVID pandemic? And only uh, 59% answer yes. In our research, what kind of spice are often made as dream during the pandemic COVID-19? More than 25% uh, answer is uh, based the ginger, 44%, and then orange, 25.5%, and and turmeric, yeah, 10%. How about the effect of spice for our body, especially now condition in the pandemic? Uh, some uh, state from the researcher said this, the cytokine release in small amount have no effect on the patient after they are, I mean, eat the spice. But this problem is, however, if the number of cytokine released in the lung is already large, it's the calling as cytokine storm. Then it will make the lungs very dense and stiff. I think this is the problem uh, in order to uh, COVID-19. Now we continued about the function of the ginger. Uh, ginger is one of the spice, very famous, I think, 
because they usually use traditional people, also Indonesia and Asia countries, because they have the function as antidepressant capacity, improve immune system, but also the inflammatory response. And the others, uh, research said, they also have a function to prevent uh, the heart disease and neurodegenerative disease, also cancer and aging process. We you know the uh, something like the biotip compound uh, gingerol and things there also function their antioxidant and uh, mycorrhizal cell and macrophag cell and others the function. And a ginger of human heart, one comprehensive study review of 109 randomized control trials. Uh, in the study, so that only 43 clinical trials or 39.4 percent met the criterion of having a high quality of evidence. It means not the all of the randomized control trial show it to us they have uh, evidence. How about the turmeric? Also, this one the spice is a very uh, often used. Also, the eight in the, our home as it's a sizzling uh, things. And then the others, a meta-analysis study, uh, we can find the RCTs suggesting a significant effect of curcumin also lowering circulation T in the APL part concentration. And then the meta-analysis did not find the curcumin to have a statistical significant effect and reducing of ADS irritable bowel system syndrome. So the other studies, the meta-analysis studies, so the curcumbins appear to be self well tolerated right? efficacies among the first patient. And uh, other studies show that the turmeric or curcumin did not decrease the several inflammatory marker in the patient with the coronary inflammatory disease. How about this? So many uh, researchers to make a state and the publish of the research, we can find not all of the study to give us the evidence how to make is the inflammatory system, how to make to us the is the uh, things good to a boiling system, and the other species to cancers. How about the lemongrass? As you know, the one of the Bioactive compound from lemongrass is the linalol oxide and epoxy linalol oxide. This is the major of component lemongrass, and we extract uh, waters. We can uh, find this uh, bioactive component. Also, the others are things neral and granule, which are compound is the essential oils. How about the effect of this uh, bioactive compound? Taken together, this data suggests that anti-inflammatory action is natural product. And try the others uh, to a treatment, something like to mice with the water extract of lemongrass, inhibit macrophage to produce interleukin one. And, uh, and then I think the lemongrass essential oil inhibit by cytokine production and PG. And then the lemongrass oil for process is significant to anti hyperlipidemic activity. And so many research, uh, we know that to make a proof this uh, data, I think. And then garlic, how about the garlic? This is one space, special use also uh, every day. Uh, some people use is the I miss the materials uh, should be uh, it, uh, but a very bit of things. The first is anticoagulants. The garlic can be interact with the warfarin as antiplatelet agents. Also, we can find that uh, the quinolone antibiotic and also hypoglycemic drug. And then garlic extract had inhibitory effect on. ABV in the chicken embryo, infection bronchitis virus is a coronavirus by Soja et al. 2016. 
we tried to find the meta-analysis uh, research, the cash control and cohort studies uh, found the moderate uh, garlic intake and to affect the digestive tract. And also in our uh, team, how about this uh, product to make the uh, good our body health is. Father metalists found the incident of stomachs consuming allium and vegetables. And also the meta-analysis of epidemical studies consumption was associated with stomach cancer in Korea. And then we continued to the audience. We know that every day when you cut the audience often cause a stinging sensation in the eye and people nearby and often uncontrollable fears. As you know, this is the cause by the release of a volatile liquid as in propanethelial esoxide and its aerosol stimulate the nerves in the eye. How about the function? This is a question. Are onions good for immune system? We try to defect the function. The first is about the prebiotic. Prebiotic concerned about the fructan to stimulate the uh, probiotic, I think, in our ingestion. And then the function is anti inflammatory and immune system, also anti cancer, in order to quercetin. This is the, also a, a good antioxidant, I think. And then detoxifying sulfur organosulfide and something like the uh, also antioxidant uh, glutathione to detoxify but waste in our body. And others, uh, a struck of onion also have been shown to have a hypoglycemic and hypolipidemic effect by normalizing their activities in order to hydroxymethylglutarin coenzyme reductase. And then the raka acramiate oil, uh, the dietary onion powder could be improved in growth, hematological parameters, and so to make a new function of beluga to the point. And other research saw that the patient with diabetes safely consumes slice of alien sepa and inhibition sufficiency also and hypoglycemic activity. Now, the hypoglycemic and hypolipidemic action of alien sepa were associated with the antioxidant activity. Now, I want to show to you, this is uh, my concern, because the one of plant product in East Kalimantan, I think it's one of the original plant, but we also can find also in other regions in Asia, also in Malaysia, and Thailand, maybe in Vietnam, also things. We Papa, try this product, yes? Two minutes more, yeah, Papa. Okay, thank you, Mr. This is Siti. And then, this is the find of the our research, especially it made to when to consume twice uh, daily of this product, made to make a total cholesterol, fine for 53 milligram per deciliter. And then this is the uh, FTR profile with the different drying methods. This is product. The closing and thank you. Without adequate nutrition, the immune system loses the momentum needed to produce an effective immune system. And also in the future, local food must be present fit, ready to serve, ready to cook, ready to eat, and ready to feed. Thank you. We back to Madrato's Mrs. City, Mrs. Mata. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pro uh, Brenatar Saragi. Now we will have a question and answer. So I have seen a lot of uh, questions posted on the chat box, and this is the first question directed to Miss Michelle. Uh, based on the data that you have presented. Indonesian concern on health is lower compared to the Philippines, China, Malaysia, and Singapore. But then why the concern about immune boost, boosting foods and gut health? Indonesia has more awareness on that. What do you um, think? 
I, I, maybe uh, thank you for the questions. I think it is not really um, they have concern, but the immune boosting, gut health, and improved sleep quality, they have a higher percentage of in favor that they find it very appealing. So it is not concern. It's they like, they, they think that it's appealing for them and they want to look for this kind of product. So it's, it's in, in, in uh, coherent with the data showing that they have high health concern. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And thank then you. The next, thank you. Then the next question is that in Pakistan, some restaurants often use MSG in their food. So what is your opinion in regard to the controversial issue on health? Ah, okay. I, I think uh, MSG has been really a hot debate in terms of application, right? Um, yes. There are some is also talk about the negative health implication. I, I think uh, it is also related to the high sodium uh, intake that could result in um, frequent eat out because they try to also dial up the, the umami food. Um, for this. So in recent, um, um, I, I wouldn't say regulation, but is to advocate in terms of reducing uh, sodium consumption, uh, also to at the same time reduce sugar and fat consumption together with these uh, three low kind of uh, uh, trends that low sodium, low fat and low sugar. So I, I think we need to uh, look at this uh, area and to actually help to improve uh, the eating out um, experience and also to improve the health when we eat out. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. the next uh, question is for Ms. Linda Chen and Dr. Tran Fan. So uh, Dr. Fan, I saw there are two questions and you have addressed it, addressed it in a chat box. So we pick up a different questions here. So there are some dietary factors that affect the growth of gut microbia. Some researchers have proved that the artificial sweetener can affect growth of the micro, uh, my gut microbia. So do you have any opinions on this? I think there was a publication about lactulose that actually this lactulose uh, not not lactulose, the other one, uh, that actually um, feeding the pathogenic uh, bacteria, let's say. What do you think? Dr. Fan or Ms. Linda? Uh, hello, uh, I'm going to, um, So uh, in my opinions, I do not support the, the, uh, the artificial sweetener um, in in terms of uh, nutrient, uh, um, nut nutritional uh, aspect, we do not support artificial sweetener. Even though that we support the uh, ideas of reducing um, sugar in our uh, dietary, but it doesn't mean that we uh, use artificial sweetener to replace it. Uh, so, um, so there, I also know that there. Are, um, the sweet, uh, artificial sweetener affects the growth of gut uh, beneficial materials. So if, if, uh, if it used together with probiotic, in, like in my presentation, it may affect to the, um, the, 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 the benefits of probiotics. So uh, it's better if we reduce the sugar in the dietary, but do not replace it by artificial sweetener. Or if we use it, please, uh, separate from the probiotic, um, the, 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 um, the foods that contain probiotics. Um. Okay, so the advice is to separate that. Mm -hmm. And then is there any the second, the second question? Okay, the second question is to increase an immunity or to prevent an inflammation of the respiratory tract, which one is more effective? to have probiotics within the food or in a form of supplement? Uh, in the research that I presented, it shows the, um, the dose of the probiotics daily. It did not show the, uh, the source 
that we add into it, like we add into food, or we uh, we use it as a supplement. So I think if the food that contain probiotics that meet the the, the the dose that we recommended, we recommended, the research we recommended is better. So both probiotic in food sources or probiotic in supplements have the same effect. Okay, thank you. So it doesn't matter what the sources are, the matter is the amount, yeah, the concentration. Okay, the next question is from Sumla from Pakistan to Dr. Hong Wei Wang. Could you suggest to us the best food as a source of trans chain amino acid? This is very good okay. practical so, question. Thank you. Yes. Thank please. you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, this is a very good question, uh, but maybe the answer is uh, complicated. Here, I will just uh, uh, shortly uh, share my opinion. Actually, when we are talking about food, we cannot say one food is the best food, because uh, given the uh, complex uh, the complex of uh, our human diet, actually we need many food, and uh, the uh, diversity of food of our diet actually is one of the important character make uh, a balanced uh, diet and then we have a balanced nutrition out of it for this uh, branch branch chain uh, amino acid uh, just as I show in my presentation, yes, uh, from a uh, uh, muscle health point of view, yes, it's good for uh, uh, building muscle. But then when uh, looking uh, into the effect on insulin sensitivity, then maybe too much is not so good. So mm -hmm. this uh, data also uh, uh, support what I just said. It's like uh, for food, we most of the time we don't really uh, focus on one food like okay this one is uh, uh, good in this or good is that or rich in this uh, component uh, that ingredient so we should take more it's not like that it should be a, a, a balance another point is uh, uh, we should also uh, uh, for uh, also uh, uh, think about uh, the uh, target population uh, for example, for uh, sports people, yes, they uh, focus on muscle building, then yes, uh, food high in branch chain amino acid is good. But for uh, people with already, for example, type 2 diabetes or in risk of uh, type 2 diabetes, then according to the data we already have now, maybe it's not good to have too much branch chain amino acid. That's I think that's also uh, in line with uh, nowadays the uh, uh, the focus of a so-called uh, uh, personalized or individualized nutrition. So uh, I think in the future we will have a more research data to help people to develop the individuals uh, uh, personalized nutrition to achieve uh, their specific uh, specific goal. That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then the next question is from Grace Halina, India. Is there any relationship between soy protein and itching, a uh, kind of allergy? Okay, this is also uh, actually a very good question because uh, this question, I think it's about uh, uh, the uh, uh, concern of uh, uh, allergy. Because we know when we are talking about soil, about soil protein, some people will worry about, okay, maybe this will make uh, me uh, allerg allergic. Uh, it's, it's fair to have this uh, uh, worry because it's true, some people, maybe they, uh, they cannot tolerate uh, soil protein or uh, other components in, uh, in, in soil. But we have to look at it in this way. Yes, there is always somebody allerg uh, allergic to uh, a certain food, but we should not avoid this food because of this. Uh, for example, if we compare uh, allergy to, to milk protein, with uh, allergy to soil protein, then actually the uh, uh, incidence of uh, allergy for uh, milk protein is much higher than soil protein. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's about uh, 
two percent of uh, people who may have uh, this uh, allergy to uh, uh, milk protein, but maybe uh, only less than one percent allergy to soy. And also for all the people who uh, uh, allergic to soy protein, I mean all the kids when they are uh, ten years old. Uh, half of them already uh, overcome this problem. So if we uh, do this comparison, then of course uh, it's fair also to say regarding this uh, uh, alert allergy uh, concern, I think for soy protein, it should be, should be okay, not a big problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we have a question. We have questions for Professor Dr. Bernatar Saragi from Taiba, Pakistan. Are onions safe for consumption next day after peeling it off? Because then the onions cannot be stored for a longer period. What do you think here, Prof? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, that is a good question, I think. Uh, as you know, because there's the biocomponent bioactive from the onions, the contact to the I think something like the oxygen to make the oxidation. After that, uh, oxidation to make the browning from the product. And then it should be to the inhibit, especially to make the uh, uh, others uh, ingredient to inhibit the decrease of the color, especially to uh, browning. I think something like uh, so many of the uh, people. Uh, store the oils in the ceilings, but at least that's not good. But if you want to the make of the uh, good of the, you should be not to the open of the slice of the things the onions. I think to make the more the long time about the uh, onions uh, function. Okay, so it's okay to peel but not to cut. Yes. Uh, and then the next question is, is there any limit concentration to use the spices or herbs as herbal drink for the immunity? Yes, I think so. Uh, but uh, as I have uh, told, this one contradiction because there are so many of the research has done, there's not uh, a significant effect and also uh, many of the research the publication said the effect of the uh, something like space or heart drink to keep also our immunity. I think so now this is one of the uh, good things uh, to make the space in our home because about the function. The function is that to uh, keep our immunity and then also to make of their body is sweet, I think, and also to make of our, uh, especially uh, maybe to brain also, to affect, to make a good our body. I think okay. that's, yeah. Thank you, Prof. So actually there are many uh, benefits of that. So before we close the session, I would like to have a very short statement from each speakers with regard to our today's topic, so your last short message to the audience. Please, uh, Ms. Uh, Michelle, I would Sorry. like to have a very short statement from all speakers as the last message to the audience. Please, just short. Oh, please. okay, thank you. Um, I, I think as from what I observe is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has actually impacted uh, a lot of our day-to-day -day life and also the way how we want to take care for ourselves and our family. So I think health is still very important. Um, I would like to urge um, the industry players and, and, and also, for example, like myself to really look at um, the needs from consumer perspective uh, to help them to improve um, their health. And at the same time, also not forgetting to allow them to continue to be able to enjoy the food that we provide and also to be able to continue to live healthily and more importantly, also to look after their mental well-being as well. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Hong Wei Wang, please, your message. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so for me, uh, 
it's very nice to be here to discuss with you about uh, sports nutrition, especially the role of soil protein. So I think the take home message for me is yes, protein is important for muscle health. But if we uh, look at uh, this in uh, a broad context, for example, we also take into uh, the uh, association of uh, uh, protein uh, with uh, chronic disease like obesity, type 2 diabetes. Then maybe uh, the amount, the sources, the amino acid profile are all important. And uh, so far, we don't really have a, a, a concerns about this. I think in the future, more study, especially uh, uh, studies on the interaction of uh, protein uh, with the gut microbiota will provide more information to answer the question like uh, uh, why, uh, how, which protein is uh, better for which purpose and uh, what's the uh, optimal amount, what's the optimal amino acid profile and regarding muscle health, how we can develop a personalized uh, nutrition strategy to help sports people to achieve their goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. And then uh, Prof. Uh, Saragi, please. Okay, thank you to Ms. Uh, Siti and all the participants today. Uh, the first is let's make the bioactive component work to our bodies to make the immunity things. After that, uh, there is the biotic compound to support our immune system, not to lose our system because this is a momentum needed to produce the effective task of immune system. And then in the future and now, I think uh, local food must be present the first in our table space, also in our home before eat the other drug. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Saragi. Uh, I see Dr. Fan is there. So please, Dr. Fan, your last message to the audience from today's okay. session. Okay. Um, at first, I would like to thank you for, um, for thanks the organizing and DuPont for giving me an opportunity to present uh, to you about the immune system and the probiotic benefits. Um, I think I received a question asking about the meta-analysis that uh, can show the more um, evidences for probiotics. And this time I just only show the um, mechanism of Im immune boost uh, of the probiotic and only two research to show the evidence, uh, scientific research evidences to support the, the idea. Uh, hopefully next time we can provide more uh, information, uh, especially meta-analysis for the probi probiotic uh, uh, benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Van. So thank you very much for all the speakers today. So Ms. Michelle, Ms. Linda, Dr. Van, Dr. Wang, and Prof. Saragi for the insightful presentation. Uh, my apology is uh, if I have my sentences split somewhere. And thank you very much also to all the participants, especially for those who have posted the questions. And thank you for all of us. So we have to give a very big round of applause to our speakers and to our staff. Thank you very much. And now I return this session to the MC. Please, Nawa. Ladies and gentlemen, Today's webinar has come to its end. Thank you for your participation and excitement.